This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 150. Wow, 150 episodes. In this episode, I will introduce my new book available on Amazon, Around the World on Foot, The Early Globetrotters. I will also share a chapter about Paul Jones from Boston, who originated the strange idea of starting these walks in a paper suit. I'm very proud of this new book. I wanted to share some details in the podcast about what my research found. Years ago, as I was doing some research into transcontinental walks and runs, I came across some newspaper articles about two German men in 1893 who are trying to walk all the way around the world, taking steamers between continents. I had never heard of something like that before, so I did some further research that resulted in episodes 38 through 45. But I still didn't understand just how many people took part in the frenzy on foot. In recent months, I researched the topic much deeper, which resulted in my new book, Around the World on Foot, the early globetrotters. The reason I'm proud of this book is that no one else has ever researched deeply the amazing event before. No one had ever before lined up side by side the hundreds of walker stories to answer many questions of why. Why were there so many walkers? Some towns got tired of globetrotters continually coming into their towns. Did any of them truly succeed in circling the globe on foot? How many of them were frauds? Why did it take so long for the public, including newspaper reporters, to catch on to some schemes? How many years did this fad last? Why did many of these globetrotters start in paper suits? Who originated that wild idea? Were there really some around the world races, as several of these globetrotters claimed? I found the answers to these questions. My book shares more than 60 stories of men and women who attempted to walk all the way around the world, including many who were conning people into thinking they were. I don't just tell the stories, I analyze them for truthfulness and validity. If a walk was legitimate, it was covered in dozens or even hundreds of newspapers as they made their progress across America, Canada, Great Britain, Europe, and Australia. For a given walker, I collected all those articles together, plotted their progress and dates from town to town to validate or invalidate their pace. It was a fascinating exercise. For example, one walker was in Salt Lake City, Utah, and the very next day, was 400 miles further west on the railroad line at Battle Mountain, Nevada. When he arrived in San Francisco, he proclaimed he had walked every mile by foot across America. In my book, I pointed out these amusing claims and inconsistencies. Some fakers would appear in towns, but have no one witnessing them going in or out of the town on foot. They would simply march into a newspaper office, give them a press release, try to set up a lecture and get free room and board. The resulting book is hopefully entertaining, a bit mind-blowing, and at times amusing. I had to pull it all together to make sure the history was told. Now to some details. In 1872, the French author Jules Verne released his renowned adventure book, Around the World in 80 Days. This novel fascinated readers with the idea of circumnavigating the world within a specific time frame and encountering incredible sights. Beginning in 1875, people began talking about the idea of walking around the world. Wagers were made and some isolated attempts began. They had no true idea how far it was around the world, what roads and trails existed, how many miles could be walked each day, and how long it would take. In 1893, a severe depression hit America called the Panic of 1893 that created massive unemployment. From 1894 to 1897, at least 300 walkers took part 
in the around-the-world-on-foot fad that became a frenzy. For some, it was a legitimate ultra-walking attempt, but for most, it was just a scam to travel on other people's generous contributions. The typical scam went like this. They claimed that they were trying to walk around the world to win thousands of dollars on a wager, like Phileas Fogg, but they had to do it without spending their own money. They needed to be funded through the generosity of others to get free room and board and free travel on ships. Walkers came out of the woodwork, and the newspaper reporters were fascinated by these attempts. Sprinkled in with these self-promoting frauds were also those who were legitimately striving to circle the globe on foot. Their efforts were genuine and very hard. They underestimated the difficulty involved, yet had amazing experiences. Ultra-running historian Andy Milroy commented, The walkers depended a lot on the very believing nature of an often isolated people who had little knowledge and understanding of what was involved in such a walk. Likewise, credulous reporters with limited knowledge had no way to validate what they were being told. They needed a story and deadlines had to be met. The walkers started off with unrealistic, naive expectations. The participants gradually compromised, took shortcuts and rides, which were edited from their accounts and possibly from their memories. They often believed what they were saying. They became part of their fictionalized narrative. The whole point was attention-seeking and gaining status that is fundamental to our society. They invested their lives in this type of activity because it gave them notoriety, a touch of fame. Eventually, some in the press got wise regarding the pretenders. These walkers started to be referred to derisively as tramps, globetrotters, cranks, fools, or around-the-world freaks. One reporter wrote, a great majority of these walkers upon the face of the earth are men who would rather do anything than work. Another astute reporter identified many of these walkers as, quote, frauds traveling over the country practicing a smooth game in order to be wined and dined. A city in New Jersey was so tired of them that they wished the world was flat so the tramps could walk off the end of it. During the around-the-world craze heydays of 1894 to 1897, there were several hundred globetrotters by foot who were mentioned in the newspapers. By 1898, the activity was diminished due to the end of the Depression in 1897 and the enlistment of men in the Spanish-American War. However, this astonishing global walking activity continued for another 40 years and about another 400 walkers until World War II shut down the fad for good. Many walkers were well-educated and certainly not the typical tramp fakers. Some of the globetrotters became famous as explorers and were given credit for conducting valid walks around the world. But did they actually do it? What was their motivation for spending months and years of their lives in this activity away from family and friends? What did they do with their lives after their walk? As you read the book, brace yourself for thrilling stories about globetrotters from long ago who walked, or maybe rode, around the world that have been collected for the first time together to be preserved in my new book, Around the World on Foot, The Early Globetrotters. Get it on your country's Amazon. I really wanted to solve the mystery of the paper suit. Who started it and why? I solved the mystery by finding the story of Paul Jones. In January 1894, a startling announcement was made in the Boston Globe by a member of the Boston Athletic Club. A man who kept his identity secret, going by Paul Jones, had accepted a $5,000 wager to walk around the world in only one year. But there was a huge twist to his challenge. He had to start naked. <gasps> Jones must present himself at the clubhouse, enter a room, and strip to the skin. 
he shall neither ask for nor receive money except for services rendered. Jones was actually Emil Charles Pfeiffer from Cambridge, Massachusetts, originally from New Hampshire. He went to Harvard, where he was on their 1889 rowing team. He worked as a teacher and a skilled newspaper advertisement writer. Jones recounted how the Around the World journey was conceived during a conversation on New Year's Eve with two affluent individuals in San Francisco. They were discussing how two Americans had traveled the globe with expenses totaling $8,000, which is valued at $300,000 today. Jones said, I expressed the belief that a man with his wits about him could start out with nothing, go around the globe and come home again in a year having made $5,000. I said I was willing to wager $5,000 on it. I really didn't have any plans when I started out. The wager was agreed to. He planned to walk from San Francisco to New York City, earn money to steam to London, England, and then head east across Europe. Jones joined in on the Around the World craze on February 12, 1894. Before leaving on foot, he used some strange ways to earn money. When the proper time came, Mr. Jones announced to those present that all who cared to see him make his first move in the great around-the-world journey could do so by paying a small admission to another room. On the door of the room given for him to take off his clothes, he put up a sign that read, Paul Jones starts around the world from this room. Admission one cent. Six reporters paid the admission to watch the naked man go to work. <coughs> Stripping to the skin, he next paid a messenger to buy him newspapers and pins. He then constructed a paper costume in fig leaf fashion. He next hired the parlor of the club for the evening and made the announcement that he would present some startling feats of personal magnetism, and by this power he would cause a chair to which he was bound hand and foot to rock violently. His teeth were clenched and every muscle tense. In about fifteen seconds the chair began to rock violently, and the onlookers made a second payment, but it was in applause this time. He raised $2.50 from the eager spectators. It was a case of bunco, and the feat was accomplished by simply bobbing his head to and fro, the chair swinging with motion. He then charged the group to sing a song for them. After that fundraising, he went back to the start room and started to make a suit of clothes that cost him four cents, made out of two newspapers, manila paper, pins, and glue. One was wrapped about his waist and the other made into short trousers. He then made a more substantial suit out of brown wrapping paper that cost him 11 cents. It took him about three hours to create it while he dined on a 45-cent supper. Dressed in more style, ready at 11.30 p.m., he again entertained guests in the parlor by performing more tricks. He had taken in $5.71 for the day, spent $2.15 on some articles, and $0.40 cents for two pieces of leather that he made into sandals. At 1.45 a.m., he left the warm rooms of the press club dressed in his paper suit, covered by a horse blanket, and headed to the Boston Tavern. Within a couple days, he had made 35 miles to Attleboro, Massachusetts. By working at a clothing store, wading tables, and shoveling snow, he had already raised a hundred dollars. He exchanged his paper suit for something more substantial and stylish. Selling the paper suit brought him a significant profit, so he made another one from a horse blanket. He had pictures of himself taken and began selling them with an autograph. He was seen charging five cents for a handshake, a quarter for an autograph, and a dollar to run a 50-yard race. He got sponsorships with the Continental Clothing House and a photography company. At Pawtucket, Rhode Island, 
he made the mistake of borrowing $50 from a professional mind reader acting as his local manager. This broke the terms of the alleged wager. Things started to unravel as Jones' secret identity became known. Jones's walk around the globe came to an apparent abrupt end about 50 miles at Providence, Rhode Island. He was arrested, taken to Springfield, Massachusetts, and thrown in the jail for non-payment of debts. It was the late and only Phineas T. Barnum who said, The American public liked to be humbugged. His deception was extensive. He led everybody who came in contact with him into the belief that the wager was a reality, when in fact it was a fake, which he admitted. His whole conduct has been a game of bluff, which has succeeded in working with some success. He is a man of an oily tongue. It turned out he wasn't even associated with the Boston Athletic Association. He confessed to devising the scam for financial gain and fame. Several individuals who are acquainted with him spoke up, testifying to his perpetual strange ideas and eccentric tendencies. He had run up debts and embezzled money from a school and was later fired. Jones wouldn't be stopped. He got out of jail and continued his walk. He denied he was a faker and showed a signed and notarized articles of agreement that had been put together for him at the start. He still had many supporters and had a large amount of mail waiting for him when he was released. Some contained offers for him to appear in several towns and cities. On March 5th, about a month into his journey, he showed up at Hartford, Connecticut. He earned $3 selling photographs and autographs. Clearly, not all of the public knew about his arrest and confession, so his scam could be continued. Still, people made fun of him. All the students of Yale proposed to have him shine their shoes at least once, paying him 25 cents. As there are about 2,000 students, the job will last about six months if he undertakes it. At Yale, he started singing, and some students paid him to stop singing. He arrived in New York City on March 9, 1894. The news characterized him as being a polished but shady businessman. He again insisted his wager was real, gave many lectures in the city, and was in no hurry to go to Europe to continue his global walk. In Brooklyn, he was hired by a drugstore to sell umbrellas at a bargain counter, dressed in a paper suit. The following week, he drew large crowds while working as a salesman at a clothing store, showcasing his suits made of paper and blankets. Jones had announced plans that he would be sailing to Europe on May 9th, but it didn't happen. Instead, he was arrested again, this time in Jersey City for skipping out on a hotel bill. He was thrown into the city jail. In July 1894, two months later, he was heading in the wrong direction in western New York at Rochester, searching for a store that would hire him to showcase his paper suit. He was hired by a dry goods store to sell autographed books and candy. It was obvious that he was no longer walking between places, taking rides instead. But for the curious, his tale is continued. This was typical. After a few months, most of these walks turned into around-the-world journeys, and they changed their wagers on the fly to allow train rides. A few weeks later, with his year half over, he was still going west and was in Erie, Pennsylvania selling handkerchiefs in a store. He was now traveling with a 15-year-old newsboy from Rochester, James Murphy, who was serving as his secretary to help him find jobs. His new plan was to tour the Midwest and then return to New York with enough money to sail to Europe. But plans during bogus wagers were easy to change. In September 1894, he said he was heading to San Francisco, California, and would then sail to Australia, heading around the world east to west. 
At the end of September, Jones arrived in Kansas City, Missouri. When asked about his motivation for his journey, he said, I want to show what an American can do by hard work and scheming. I decided to become a freak for a year. I figured on people's curiosity and readily went into the wager. He said he had earned between $3.50 to $115 per day for a total of $3,500 valued at $125,000 today. Not bad for seven months. Shamefully, at the end of October 1894, Jones deserted his boy Murphy, leaving him in Kansas City without funds. Murphy said he was tired of the, quote, freak business anyway. Jones left a letter for him asking to meet in Denver, only to go east and abandon Murphy. The boy obtained employment from a famous boxer, James Corbett, the heavyweight champion of the world, carrying his bags on a trip to the west. Murphy said of Jones, He did me dirty, and I'll bob around a while and make him some trouble when he returns to Boston next spring. Jones rode the train to New York City. He soon took a steamship to Liverpool, England, arriving about mid-November 1894 on the Umbria, selling photographs to the 332 passengers. He was hosted at the London Concentric Club on November 21st. He entertained them by singing and then told the familiar tale of how his journey started. The newspapers wrote me up, and I soon found that I could make money. I was hired by proprietors of various kinds of businesses to work for them. Some paid me $25 a day for three days. I had got as much as $200 for a week. I traveled over a great part of the United States. I exhibited my paper suit everywhere. I thought it was time to come to Europe. He had thought of going around the streets of England in his paper suit and wearing advertisements on the collar and around the chest and back, but the damp climate wouldn't make that possible. He told them he was heading to Germany, France, Egypt, India, China, Japan, Vancouver, Canada, and then back to Boston. For the remaining seven weeks of his trip, Jones traveled 2,000 miles by boat and train to Brussels, Berlin, Rome, Naples, Italy, and then by steamer via the Suez Canal to Hong Kong and then Japan. He sailed from Japan on the Empress of Japan in steerage to Vancouver, Canada, arriving on January 15, 1895, with about one month left. He next headed to Seattle, Washington, and on to Portland, Oregon. After riding the train to Spokane, Washington, he boarded the Northern Pacific Express to head east and pass through Montana the next day. He still had 13 days to reach Boston by his year deadline. On the way, unexpectedly, he left the train and stayed at a hotel in Minneapolis on February 2nd. He worked for several days in a dry goods store and left the city on February 5th. From that point, Jones disappeared. You might have been expecting a huge large-scale event to be organized and advertised on February 12th to celebrate the culmination of his around-the-world expedition. Instead, there was silence. There was no mention in the newspapers at all. Why? Because the Boston newspapers, the Boston Athletic Association, and Jones all knew the wager was a huge hoax. Additionally, there were likely creditors eager to pursue him once more on his return. Jones quietly returned to Cambridge, Massachusetts and resumed his true identity of Emil Pfeiffer. With no solid proof that he arrived in Boston on February 12, 1895, the San Francisco examiner speculated that he had been committed to an asylum. Others believed that the original Paul Jones was still in a Rhode Island penitentiary, serving a five-year term, and that an impersonator had been the Globetrotter. More than two months later, the Boston Globe reported that Jones was claiming that he won his wager. 
They didn't believe it. What really happened remains a globetrotter tramp mystery. This we know. In 1898, Pfeiffer said he would ride through the eastern states and in each town he visits he would print a paper without dismounting his bicycle. Instead, he got married that year in Cambridge, Massachusetts to Molly Holbrook. They then moved to Seattle, Washington, near her family, where he continued in the newspaper business and had a daughter. While in Boston in 1901, he was arrested once more, this time for petty theft and fraudulent acquisition of funds, which the Boston Globe considered a concise summary of his existence. He later moved to California, where he died on November 25, 1934, in Los Angeles, California. If nothing else, Paul Jones, a.k.a. Emil Pfeiffer, invented the story of the paper suit, which was copied by at least 20 globetrotters in the years following him. To get more of this story, get my book, Around the World on Foot, The Early Globetrotters, on Amazon. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.